My name is Adam Blackwell. I'm the Vice President, International Development Services Group. And on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, I'll be moderating this session titled Understanding al shafs Mass Attacks in Somalia. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism. The views expressed are those of the presenter. Dr. Paul Williams is a professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, he holds the prestigious position of director of the Master's of Arts program in the Security Stud uh, Policy Studies, showcasing his leadership and commitment to shaping the next generation of professionals in the field. Uh, Dr. Williams has significantly contributed to the academic discourse on peacekeeping, a subject he explores in depth in his acclaimed book titled Understanding Peacekeeping, which is now in the third edition as of 2021. This publication uh, by Politi Press underscores his expertise and authority in the realm of international peacekeeping. Uh, his research extends to specific case studies as evident in his work, Fighting for Peace in Somalia, a History and Analysis the Africa Union Mission, 2007-2017, published by the Oxford University Press in 2018. This book delves into the complexities of the African Union Mission in Somalia, providing a detailed and historical account and analytical insights into the critical period of conflict, resolution, and peacekeeping efforts in the region. Dr. Williams will speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we will move to a Q&A. Please note your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom as we progress, and we will get to them at the end of the formal presentation. Um, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Adam, for that very kind um, introduction. And I'm just going to share a few slides with you all because I think my subject matter today is, is going to be helped if I can show you some maps and, and images and um, you know, rather sadly morbid pictures about things. But as Adam mentioned, um, thank you very much for the, the invitation. I'm going to speak today about the uh, the issue on, on the screen now, conventional insurgents, uh, understanding al-Shabaab's mass attacks against African Union's bases in Somalia. And for those of you that, that don't know me, I'm a, an academic who's been studying issues of war and conflict and particularly peace operations in Africa for, for nearly 25 years now. And I got seriously interested in um, the Somalia case when the African Union deployed its peacekeepers there back in, in early 2007. And what I want to talk to you about today is some of the sort of depressing and, and sad images like you can see on the, the screen at the moment. Um, these are some uh, photos and stills basically taken from an Al-Shabaab propaganda video um, that was made when they attacked the Ugandan forward operating base at, at Bulu Maria, uh, which is just southwest of, of Mogadishu. Um, you can see the date there in the, the middle, 26th of May 2023. And these, unfortunately, are quite common um, images of Al-Shabaab overrunning uh, African Union bases in Somalia over the last decade or so, you'll see there they destroy equipment, they take hostages, they kill obviously a lot of the um, of the uh, soldiers on these bases. And what I'm going to talk to you about specifically is an article that has probably spent me about 10 years um, working on now and before it was published earlier this year, looking at the reasons why Al-Shabaab was so successful in overrunning nearly half a dozen of these African Union forward operating bases. This is a very rare event in the world of peace operations generally. In fact, I only know of just a couple of other cases outside of Somalia where this has happened to peacekeepers. So it's not quite a uniquely Al-Shabaab um, military method, but Al-Shabaab, I, I would argue, are the most sort of um, you know, specialized and frequent perpetrators of this approach. And sadly, as you'll see the date there, you know, I, I had this article published at the end of April 2023. And then just, yeah, within a, a couple of weeks, uh, Al-Shabaab did it again in the Bula Maria case that I, I just showed you. Now, um, why Somalia and why the African Union? For those of you that are not as much in the, the weeds, maybe, of this case as, as I am, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background on, you know, why this mission is an important case for us to think about. And the short versions are, as I put up here, right, in the African Union's peacekeeping operation in, in Somalia is now the longest uh, running and the largest of all the African Union's peace operations. 
uh, deployed in 2007, just within three years, it became the world's most deadly peace operation by a considerable margin for the, the reasons partly that I'm, I'm going to talk about now. Um, it was also costing a lot of money. By 2014, when the mission was over 20,000 um, uh, troops strong, it was costing various international partners about $1 billion a year to keep the mission running. And by 2017, it was actually the world's largest peace operation of any organization, um, African Union, UN, European Union. Um, it was the biggest one in Somalia. And as a result of those things, it became a key case study I would say, for a lot of wider debates about peace operations, particularly the relationship between peacekeeping and, and counterinsurgency. And as you can see from this picture here, this is how you know the, the AU's mission in Somalia has always started off, right? It's really more about counterinsurgency and protecting the transitional government in Somalia than really traditional peacekeeping. And you may recall that when the mission first arrived in Mogadishu in, in March 2007, it was comprised of just one troop contributing country. Uh, Uganda was the only country to send troops um, and deploy in Mogadishu. And it deployed about 1600 soldiers. That was two battle groups at the time to the four places that you see here. Um, the peacekeepers helped basically secure the airport, the seaport, and then Villa Somalia, which is the, the seat of government where the, the transitional government was based in, in Mogadishu there on the top right and what's called K4 uh, traffic junction, basically the main road system to drive from the airport to Villa Somalia, you needed to control the K4 junction. And that's how Amazon started off its life in 2007. And since then, it basically grew um, rather slowly, as you can see here, this is a chart showing the timeline of how many soldiers were deployed in the mission. And as you can see down here at the bottom, um, initially it was only Uganda, and then Burundi joined them in, in the um, beginning of 2008. But it took uh, the African Union about three and a bit years to deploy the authorised strength of 8,000 soldiers to Mogadishu, which was the original plan. And for that reason alone, right, it only had a few thousand soldiers. It couldn't do much to escape Mogadishu. And so until the middle of 2011, Amazon was only a peace operation deployed in parts of one city. But by the middle of 2011, and you'll see now it was up to about eight to 10, well, nearly 9,000 um, troops, they managed to push Al-Shabaab fighters out of, of central Mogadishu in August of 2011 and take over the sort of um, the in surrounding suburban areas by uh, early 2012. And it was at that point that Amazon spread to the image that you see here, when the Ugandans and Burundians were joined by Kenyans, later Djiboutians and Ethiopians as well. And so by about, as I show you here on this map, by 2015, the mission had increased to about 22,000 soldiers spread out, not just in Mogadishu, but spread out across most of South Central Somalia. Um, this is an enormous geographic territory. Uh, if you're not familiar with the size of Somalia, what I'm showing you on this map here is about two thirds the size of Iraq. And remember how many thousands of, of troops the US had in um, in Iraq, you know, well over 100,000 plus. Amazon's 22,000 troops were spread out in a large number of forward operating bases um, represented here by the national flags that you see um, accordingly. And so in that sense, that's a very quick sort of version of how Amazon grew from a very small mission based in, in the capital of Mogadishu to this much larger and sort of thinly dispersed force um, by the time we get to the subject of my talk, which is the attacks by al-Shabaab. And we must remember that you know, the reason al-Shabaab was attacking Amazon was that this precisely wasn't an impartial peacekeeping operation. The African Union took sides in the war in Somalia. They deployed their peacekeepers, or at least they called them peacekeepers, but they deployed their forces very much to protect one side in the, the conflict. That was the transitional federal government. And hence, they were largely fighting against al-Shabaab from the, the get-go. So this is very much a mission that is engaged in war fighting, not peacekeeping. And it's for that reason why I would argue that the African Union should have expected that al-Shabaab was going to try and attack it by whatever means it could and um, whatever it could. And that brings me to the, the focus of, of my talk and, and the article that I, I just mentioned, 
And that was an analysis really of, of al-Shabaab's military methods, and particularly one of the methods that had been very successful. So if you take that Amazon story that I've just told you and sort of do it in reverse for, for al-Shabaab, if we think of al-Shabaab's military methods from 2007 until the end of 2011, al-Shabaab was mainly playing on defense in an urban warfare context, right? Defending parts of Mogadishu, Kismayo and some other places where it was um, it was based. But after it's kicked out of Mogadishu and later kicked out of Kismayo as well and by Doha and Belatwain and a few other towns around um, south central Somalia, Al-Shabaab's military methods shift from fundamentally, you know, urban defense into our more familiar terrain of, of guerrilla warfare. And that's where, you know, why they've been operating now for the last decade or so. What does that mean? It means they were engaged in all sorts of destabilization and, and sort of harassment tactics. They would regularly ambush convoys. They would assassinate individual targets. They would engage in sniper attacks against the African Union. They would engage in probing attacks, whether with grenades or, or mortars, and then quickly um, you know, retreat. Their preferred weapon, I would argue, over the years became IEDs, um, including suicide bombers, um, you know, driving and, and working some of those, as I'll talk about. They engaged in commando raids where small numbers of their sort of elite fighters would um, go on effectively suicide raids against either civilian or military targets. But they would also engage in what I'm going to talk about now, which is more sort of conventional style mass attacks on African Union forward operating bases. And these would engage, you know, anywhere between sort of three to five hundred Al-Shabaab attackers. So quite large um, formations in the context of the of the war in Somalia. And if you look at what um, Al-Shabaab did in terms of these mass attacks, I'm only looking at the ones against the African Union. I should just put that up front. Um, Al-Shabaab has also attacked a lot of forward operating bases of the Somali army, but I'm not analysing them. Uh, those ones in, in this case here. The first ever attack Al-Shabaab did on an African Union FOB was in 2012, and it ended in, in complete failure. It was against the Kenyans in, in Sector 2, and uh, they saw them coming. They basically you know, defended very effectively, and Al-Shabaab attackers were decimated. But after a couple of years of rethinking their tactics, Al-Shabaab returned now with a new set of successful methods. And between 2015 and 2017, and then again in 2022, and then again in May of 2023, as I just mentioned, Al-Shabaab effectively overran half a dozen of the African Union's um, operating bases in Somalia. And my best estimate is that it killed in those six um, or seven cases. Uh, over 500 peacekeepers and wounded um, scores more. And my argument, if you boil it down to its essence, is basically that Al-Shabaab was successful for a combination of, of reasons. And that combination was to do with the African Union's weaknesses and some Al-Shabaab tactical innovation that, that really worked quite well. And so just to, to give you the lie of the land in terms of which attacks and, and battles I analyze. In the article version, I focus mainly on the, the six battles that I've listed here at the top, and I've, I've put them on the, the map on the, the right-hand side for you. Of these six battles, all of them except the one of green, in green, the, the case of Halgan in 2016, um, in the five cases in black, Al-Shabaab successfully overran the African Union base and killed a lot of the soldiers that were, you know, guarding those um, that that FOB. In the green example, though, the Ethiopian defenders actually again succeeded in in repelling um, Al Shabaab attackers. I also look at you know three other cases in a bit less detail. The two cases uh, in Husingo and, and Bula Maria in 2012 and 2018 were also examples of cases where the African Union troops successfully defended against Al-Shabaab's attack. And then the case I just started with earlier on, you know, after I'd published the article, a little while later, an attack on Bula Maria. I should say Bula Maria is, is just around here, uh, if you can see my, my cursor on that map. And that was another Ugandan um, uh, forward operating base. So my analysis is based on those sort of six main battles and then some of those other ones as, um, as mini case studies. And the argument is, as I said, it's a combination of African Union failures and Al-Shabaab successes. And what do I mean by that in a bit more detail? Well, 
If you look at how the African Union's forces were organized and the force employment tactics that they used, I would argue that this ultimately left a lot of vulnerabilities which Al-Shabaab was able to exploit with sadly very deadly consequences. Uh, the first element of this is that the AU, as you saw earlier, was a, a very dispersed force. It was spread very thinly across a massive amount of territory. At its peak in January 2017, there were 87 forward operating bases in the AU mission. Um, again, I'd said there was about 22,000 soldiers total. But almost all of these, uh, and this would be the second point, were stationed or garrisoned with very small contingents, normally company or company plus formations. So most of those FOBs had somewhere between 100 to 200 African Union troops on them. And as I'll talk about in a minute, you know, this was simply not enough when faced with a major mass assault by, um, by Al-Shabaab forces. The third problem or the third factor here that, that leads to AU vulnerabilities is that it set out these forward operating bases really from late 2014 onwards. And it was after the AU had stopped going on offensive operations against Al-Shabaab. Remember, I said the AU had kicked Al-Shabaab out of Mogadishu in, in late 2011. And for most of 2012 and 2013 and early part of 2014, the African Union was on offense. It was kicking Al-Shabaab out of various settlements in South Central Somalia. But after this, it stopped. It, it engaged in a period of what I call consolidation. And it became a much more static force spread across those 87 bases that I, I mentioned. And that took the sort of the when they took their foot off the gas pedal, if you like, Al-Shabaab then was able to get back on on track and was able to take the uh, initiative and, and conduct a number of successful offences against the AU forces. The fourth problem for the AU was that the bases that it did have were very poorly defended. Uh, the mission was generally under resourced you know, that there wasn't enough personnel to cover this size of terrain. The, also, the design of the forward operating bases themselves had a number of problems. Um, the, the peacekeepers sadly didn't clear good killing ground areas around their bases. They had very poor perimeter defences. The perimeters were too large. They were often literally circular, as I'll show you in a minute. And they also failed to get out and about and dominate the area. And I think I just want to show you a a few photos and, and images to sort of make the, the point here about how poorly defended they were. This is a, a satellite image of the forward operating base at El Ade. Um, this was based by, uh, staffed by um, Kenyan personnel. There were about 200 Kenyan soldiers on this base in January um, 2016 when Al-Shabaab attacked. And as you can see here, it's nearly a square kilometer in size and generally around perimeter, which is sort of the least defensible of all the shapes we could pick. Um, another example, this is the Bula Maria base um, in May of, of this year, 26th of May, um, when this is now Ugandan soldiers. You'll see here the, the settlement or, or town of Bula Maria. The African Union forward operating base is off to the southwest. Again, it's a round perimeter. It's quite large. In this case, it's very near a main road, which Al-Shabaab exploited. And uh, yeah, this was a, a big problem. You'll see now that the AU finally learned a little bit about this. This is the forward operating base at Janale, again, a Ugandan FOB. Janale was one of the first forward operating bases to be overrun in 2015. And at the time of the attack in 2015, it did not look like it does now in 2023. It wasn't a good triangular forward operating base, as you can see here. Instead, um, this is what the Janale operating base looked like in the middle of February 20, uh, middle of 2015, when it was attacked by Al Shabaab forces. And that time, it was overrun, and most of the Ugandan soldiers were were killed. I've circled here in red what you can see here: the very poor perimeter defences there. It's just a couple of layers, if that, of Hesco barriers, uh, and that was it. Right, that was all the perimeter defence they had. Another example here is from the Kenyans, this time at the base in, in Kolbio on the, the Somali-Kenyan border. This one was overrun by Al-Shabaab in early 2017. And again, if you look here up at the top left, you'll see the enormous perimeter. Uh, there were less than 200 soldiers 
stationed on on this one as well and you know spread over a very large and poorly defended base this bottom left picture here is is uh, still taken from one of al shabab's propaganda videos of the attack um but it was yeah it, it makes the point that it was poorly defended um a fifth problem for the au was that they were basically a land force at the time there was no aviation assets there were no helicopters either utility or um or attack helicopters under the african union force commander's control in fact it didn't get any of those until december 2016 when the kenyans deployed a few helicopters in their own sector but they didn't allow those helicopters to operate in other troop contributing country sectors and so there was no prospect of um a rapid response if you like or uh, you know aviation assets in the form of helicopter gunships coming to the rescue. So these FOBs were largely on their own because the only reinforcement they could hope to um, to have was, was via land. They were also disjointed, as I showed you the map. The Ugandans operated in their sector, Kenyans, Ethiopians, Djiboutians, etc., did the same. And as a result, the mission was not able to coordinate effective cross-sector operations against Al-Shabaab. And again, it meant when an FOB was attacked, it was largely on its own. The seventh point and fundamental problem, arguably, was that they didn't learn from earlier attacks. You know, those first successful attacks in the middle of 2015 should have been a wake up call for the AU and how it organized its defenses. But it didn't. Uh, Al-Shabaab continued to use the same tactics over and over again, and the AU proved unable to basically respond and adapt. And part of the reason and, and the last point I would make here Part of the reason why they were poor at adapting was that the, the AU troops didn't get out and about, really. They didn't dominate the terrain around their FOBs, and they didn't engage effectively with either local civilian populations or the Somali security forces in the area, largely because of, of issues of mistrust um, that I can talk about if you want later on. Um, and that leads us finally to the Al-Shabaab side of the, um, of the story here. If those were the AU's weaknesses and, and hence vulnerabilities, what was happening on the Al-Shabaab side to you know, see successful forms of, of force employment? Well, the basic one sentence version is that they were able to exploit those A AU vulnerabilities very effectively. And I would argue it's because of five major reasons. Um, the first one is organizational adaptability. Unlike the African Union, Al-Shabaab was able to adapt its military methods. As I said, it, it fought largely an urban defensive war from 2006 to, to 2011. But after 2012, it successfully reinvented itself as a, as a guerrilla outfit. Um, now, I obviously focused on the more sort of conventional mass attacks. But yeah, it, it was able to adapt very successfully in terms of its, its strategies and, and tactics. Second thing it was able to do very well was exploit sanctuaries. And what I mean by that is there was areas um, where it was able to operate that were largely beyond the control of the Somali government. And hence, Al-Shabaab became the sort of de facto government in those areas. It was able to control local populations pretty effectively. It was able to cross very porous international borders, particularly with, um, with Kenya. And it was able to use very localized areas of territory to train its troops, prepare its soldiers and, and even muster you know, forces for these specific attacks. Thirdly, it was able to exercise uh, surprise effectively, and it, it used surprise at both the tactical and strategic level. Tactically, its new tactics were to always attack these FOBs just before dawn. So while it was dark, about normally half an hour to 45 minutes before um, daybreak. That is when it would launch its, uh, its attacks on these FOBs. But also it had the strategic element of surprise. Um, I've looked at a whole lot of internal uh, AU documents discussing these issues. And, and fundamentally, the AU didn't predict that Al-Shabaab would be able or even would try to overrun its FOBs. And so they didn't really seriously do anything to prevent it. And that was a real you know, tactical error on the part of the AU that Al-Shabaab exploited. And then fourth, and arguably probably, you know, the, the key one here, put all these things together, Al-Shabaab was able to come up with a set of tactics that really worked. It developed new military methods after its failed attacks um, on AU FOBs in 2012 and 2013. And the key here was two things. 
Number one was using suicide vehicle-borne IEDs. So it started it, its, its attacks on these FOBs with two, sometimes three, um, vehicles driven in um, to the gate areas or, or perimeters of these AU bases and then exploded. Um, and it followed those in with waves of, in some cases, several hundred um, infantry and uh, technicals. Um, technicals, I should say, you know, being the, the word for like normally a Toyota Hilux truck of some sort with a mounted um, machine gun or, or heavy weapon on, on top of it. And Al-Shabaab would often have up to half a dozen of these technicals involved in the um, attacks as well. But it was that combination of the you know, dark just before dawn attack with VBIDs and mass troops that really proved you know, deadly effective against the AU. And finally, unlike the AU, Al-Shabaab had an excellent intelligence network. It knew pretty much everything the AU soldiers were up to, um, their rotation cycles, their logistics supply cycles, they knew the potential routes that any rescuers or reinforcements might come. And so it attacked when it knew it was going to have the, the upper hand, whereas the AU, as you know, had to defend sort of all its bases all of the time. Al-Shabaab just had to find the right circumstances once or twice. And uh, yeah, the, the net result of this was, by my estimates, uh, over 500 AU peacekeepers killed and many, many more wounded. And uh, I'll stop it there and uh, hand back over to, to Adam. Happy to take any questions or, or things you would like to discuss. Thanks very much, Paul. Very interesting, as always. Um, I should have told you at the outset that I was actually in Somalia in the humanitarian assistance in the early uh, 1990s. And it seems we really haven't learned very much uh, 30 years on, but anyway, we have some good questions for you. If I can open it. Sure. In, uh, in your view, how linked are the uh, Al-Shabaab uh, complex attacks to concurrent operations? For example, in the 2014-2015 attacks that occurred during Operation Eagle and Indian Ocean, El Ade in 2016 and Kolbiyu came when the Juba corridor was underway. And finally, Sirbaraf in 2022 came in the run up to the planned operation in middle Shaveli, and Bulumerer uh, came in the middle of the community led offensive in Hir Shaveli and Galmudug. I hope I got those names right. And excuse me, yeah, my, I'm not known for my accurate pronunciation of, of Somali place names, uh, so apologies in advance. But yeah, that's a good question, um, Alistair. But, and I, there's a sort of two-part answer to it in as much as I think a few of the cases were directly connected to what Amazon was doing in terms of its operations. And the others, I think, were connected indirectly by default. And what I mean by that is, um, I think some of the attacks came because in the 2015 to 2017 period, the African Union had stopped going on the offensive operations that you talk about there, right? Operation Eagle and, and Indian Ocean. And so I think the explanation for most of the Al-Shabaab attacks is that Amazon had stopped going on offense. Al-Shabaab was no longer feeling on the back foot and it had time to prepare, train, plan and muster its forces to, to go after these, you know, what it thought was particularly vulnerable FOBs. But you're right to point out Colbio in particular, right? That was a case where it was a direct relationship between what the African Union and actually some US forces had been doing. So Colbio, my argument would be, or my interpretation would be, that it came actually after an attempted offensive against one of Al-Shabaab's strongholds towards the, the town of Jilib. This is now right down in the southern um, Jubaland region of um, Somalia. And I think ultimately what happened there was that the AU with some US support stirred up a bit of a hornet's nest, actually. And the, the hornets came back and counterattacked. And it was the Colbio base that bore the brunt of that, um, yeah, that counterattack by, by the Al-Shabaab forces. Um, I know less about the situation in, in Bula Maria in, in the lead up to May 2023. I wasn't following the, the situation as closely there. But that's basically my answer to your question. Yeah, for most of the attacks, it came when the AU had taken their foot off the pedal, right, and were not doing offensive operations against Al Shabab. But definitely, the Colbio case was was not like that. That was a, there was a direct relationship, I think, there between a 
a Kenyan and US supported push against Al Shabaab and a, a, a successful counterattack? Please put your questions, folks, in the Q&A uh, function in uh, Zoom, and we will get to them quickly. Um, another question from Alistair uh, is, how much do you, th do you see the 2013 um, Ashraf purge and the death of Gurain in 2014 as contributing to the group's ability to adapt following the disastrous campaign to hold Mogadishu? Yeah, another good question, Alistair. So, um, I mean... My answer to that would be, yeah, you had a you had a sort of different Al Shabab in 2014, right, than you did in the years previous. And so the period that I'm looking at here, when they really go on offense against these bases, is 2015 onwards. So it's very much that, you know, it's Al Shabab after the purge. I think it's a, a more focused organization after Gadani's death. I think, you know, they're they're much more purposeful in that they feel they've rooted out the sort of, um, you know, they've got rid of the non-true believers. They've got rid of the sort of, um, uh, you know, people that they didn't think were, were quite as committed to the cause. And I think here that you had quite a, you know, a unified and coherent Al-Shabaab that was able to plan to punch the African union in what it saw as a key vulnerability. Um, I think that's a, yeah, an important part of the, the story. I don't know how it much it how much of it was down to sort of personal leadership dynamics in the you know within the Shura Council in in Al Shabab, but I think they they identified you know as I've said here a very serious vulnerability in the AU's force posture and they exploited it very well um, and this was you know uh, different from the the last few years and their first two attempts to do that. Um, I will, Al Alistair, I'm going to, you have another question here. I'm going to go to um, to another one and we'll come back. Um, how is the drawdown of uh, Atmos going to affect the Somalian army? Yeah, that's a good a good question, um, Abdiaziz. So look, I can't predict the future, so I'm, you know, I'm, I can't do that necessarily accurately, but here's my sense of the, of the trends. So as Atmis is withdrawing, um, it's already draw, drawn down nearly 3,000 troops now over the last year and a bit, and it's supposed to draw down another 3,000 actually just in the next couple of, of weeks um, until the end of December. And then it's meant, for those of you that have not been following this, it's meant to draw down completely by the end of uh, December 2024, so another you know, roughly 12 and a half months from now. So it's affecting the Somali army in a couple of ways. Number one is that the forward operating bases I've talked about here, some of them are being handed over directly to the Somali army and some of them are being closed down. So the first question for the Somali army is that they're going to have to inherit at least some of this very dispersed footprint of, of forward operating bases that I've you know just described. That, in my opinion, is a sort of worrying responsibility for the SNA, um, the Somali National Army, to, to take on. Because where it adopts the same locations for these forward operating bases, you know, some of them are very vulnerable to this type of mass attack. So that's the fourth, first point. The second point is it's showing some important differences in sort of, um, I suppose, strategic and operational culture between the AU and the Somalis, in that the positions that the African Union has put its bases in are not always the positions that the Somali army would want to have its bases. Now, the, this varies from place to place, but the sort of the generic answer here is that, as I showed you in the picture of um, Bulo Maria and, and Janale, if the local settlement or town is sort of here, the, the AU has always put its FOBs quite a bit away from the the local population and a bit out, you know, further either along a, a road artery or, or further away. And that's because they may not be able to speak the local languages as well. They're not as comfortable mingling with the local populations. Whereas I think the Somali National Army would be much more comfortable operating at sort of different areas and often closer proximity to um, Somali settlements. So that's going to be an argument. And then the third thing that, of course, is happening is, well, this is this is reducing the military force that is fighting al-Shabaab. And um, last time I checked, you know, the, we're not militarily defeating Al-Shabaab with all the forces we've got in the field. So reducing those forces by another 3,000 is going to put a lot of additional pressure 
on the Somali army as it faces um, as it faces Al Shabaab. So I think those are the main reasons or main factors of, of how it's going to affect the the Somali National Army. Excellent. We have another uh, question here. Um, how much, if at all, do you think a lack of international humanitarian assistance has made it uh, the people reliant, dependent on Al Shabaab? What, what's the relationship there? I mean, so I don't think it's all down to humanitarian aid, but you're right to say that this is a, you know, there are large parts of South Central Somalia where it's very difficult, if not impossible, to access. And it's really difficult to access even in like when it's dry and the the places are not flooded and things like this. So it's it's very difficult in general. I think, though, Al-Shabaab has benefited by the fact that there's a lot of local populations that are caught in a very difficult dilemma. And that is essentially that, there's no you know, guaranteed commitment by either the African Union or the Somali government to be able to provide these people with you know, serious protection against al-Shabaab. And so I think most of the populations that work with al-Shabaab have done so for basically pragmatic reasons that they need to make a deal with these militants because there are there is no cavalry on the horizon coming to sort of you know rescue them or provide them with an alternative so i don't think it's a case that you know al shabab stopping humanitarian aid flows you know enables al shabab to sort of control these populations i think often it's a lot of local groups that are having to make pragmatic decisions that if they've got no realistic alternative to getting out of or defeating al shabab in their area they just make the best deal that they can. And so I think that's the dynamic that that I would point to more than sort of um, humanitarian assistance playing a key role here. Um, here's another good question. Uh, how do the major attacks on peacekeeper, the successful uh, major attacks on peacekeeping forces feed into the AS uh, propaganda and communications and I guess recruitment and financing? Yeah, I think it's, you know, as I showed you with the photos and some of the stills from Al-Shabaab's propaganda videos, I think it's been a major boon to them in in propaganda terms right so two things to say here you know one is they've killed lots and lots of african union peacekeepers they've displayed their bodies id cards you know it's been a terrible propaganda loss for the for the au in that sense secondly they've been able to steal a whole lot of equipment ammunition uniforms id cards you know all sorts of military materiel and again this is great fodder for al shabab's propaganda ma machine thirdly i mean we've got to admit it they made some really good you know exciting videos about these horrible battles right and the as you probably you know know if you're on a session like this you know they've been very effective at dispersing those across social media you know facebook the twitter sphere and etc before they got you know taken down They've produced very slick videos, and that's often because, um, at least in the battles I studied most closely, you would often have up to six Al-Shabaab cameramen operating and following each of these attacks at the front lines. And so the videos they were producing, I think, did help quite a lot in terms of that, you know, rousing sort of propaganda to help with recruitment. It was showing that the African Union peacekeepers were definitely not invincible. They were vulnerable. You know, they could be beaten join us we've got the upper hand etc so yeah i think it's been a very important part of of al shabab's um propaganda and and in comparison the au has really struggled to sort of counter that narrative you know and so yeah uh, i i think those are the different ways it's it's supported al shabab's propaganda um here's one that kind of dovetails to what i was going to ask you um after the total drawdown of the uh, at this, will you know how will the neighboring countries? I mean, Ethiopia and Kenya, uh, who have you know serious border issues, um, how will they react? Will they come to the assistance of the Somali army to fight Al Shabaab? Will there be a and more training as more international uh, military assistance being put in place uh, to help the uh, Somali army deal with this? Yeah, again, I can't predict the future with any certainty, but my my guesstimate would be that, look, um, both Ethiopian and Kenyan forces arrived in Somalia before they were part of the peacekeeping operation. Ethiopia, you know, really started it all off, right, in, in 2006 with its intervention, bringing the transitional federal government into Mogadishu. It's actually that Ethiopian intervention, which is the reason we have al-Shabaab in the form that we have it today, 
right? It was Al-Shabaab rallying Somalis against the Ethiopian invasion of 2006 that really made Al-Shabaab go from a tiny fringe, you know, extremist element to a massive national resistance movement almost, right? So same with Kenya. Kenya intervened unilaterally initially in, in 2011 and didn't join the African Union mission until later. So my argument or my my guess about the future would be just because you close down Atmis doesn't mean that the national security threat from Al-Shabaab for both Ethiopia and Kenya goes away. So I would say there's a very high likelihood that you'll continue to see Ethiopian and Kenyan soldiers in and around the border areas with Somalia, presumably with a bilateral agreement with the Somali federal government. So yeah, I think that's that's very likely to, to be the case even after Atmis ends. And I would also argue, and I've written at least once, that I think there's a high likelihood that the Somali federal government would also make a bilateral deal with Uganda um, so that Uganda could retain some troops. Um, they, they have developed, as, as I've said, you know, from 2007 till 2023, the Ugandan military has been operating in Mogadishu and Sector 1 um, of, the, of the mission, you know, down the coastline. And they have built up a lot of important and valuable military experience of how to fight against Al-Shabaab. Now, they've lost a few battles, as I've, I've shown you here, but overall, they're a, a very good outfit. And um, it wouldn't be surprising to me that even if Atmis ends, the federal government of Somalia might ask for a number of Ugandan soldiers to um, continue either, as Adam mentioned, you know, in a, in a training and assisting and mentoring role, or maybe even more sort of direct um, you know, engagements. But that's that's my guess. I, I can't predict the, the future. We have a couple more for you, uh, Paul. So I'm going to... Um, well, no, this, this is a really good one on, on the lifting of the arms embargo and how that might affect uh, Al-Shabaab's tactics or ability to carry out such mass attacks. That is a good question. Um, again, these are all sort of future-oriented, so I'm, I'm guesstimating here, right? But um, look, we can say a couple of things. I do think you'll notice Al-Shabaab stopped these attacks from 2017 until 2022. And it did so, at least against the African Union, I should be clear. It did a few against um, the Somalis. But I think a major reason why was that the Trump administration in the United States really significantly increased its airstrikes against not just targeted sort of leadership decapitation strikes against Al-Shabaab leaders, but it really ramped up the number of airstrikes it was um, targeting against the rank and file of Al-Shabaab's forces who had been able previously to muster and plan, you know, and, and launch these attacks quite effectively. There was a couple of cases where US airstrikes had actually hit some quite large numbers of Al-Shabaab forces that were mobilizing for these attacks. Now, the, uh, the arms embargo is going to have no impact on that dynamic, right? That if it was sustained air support and airstrikes, which was part of the reason why Al-Shabaab didn't do these attacks, then the arms embargo doesn't affect that equation, right? That's to do with American sort of decisions, and now to a lesser extent Turkey, because Turkey is also operating some armed drones in, um, in part of Somalia. But the arms embargo, excuse me, does have an impact on another area, and that's obviously the Somali National Army's willingness and capabilities to go on offense. So the Somali government will tell us that, you know, this is great that the arms embargo has been lifted. If it can get some access to some more heavy weapons, this is what sort of held it back against Al-Shabaab. And now the lifting of the arms embargo should mean it can, you know, degrade Al-Shabaab more effectively. I would tend to be a bit sceptical of, of that argument. I don't think it's a lack of weaponry that is the major reason why, you know, we've struggled to defeat Al-Shabaab militarily. I think the fundamental reason there, as I said, is that Al-Shabaab has adapted to become a very tricky, you know, slippery, effective sort of transnational network and a guerrilla network that operates very, very effectively. And they're very hard to catch and pin down and have any major sort of military engagement. So you can have a lot more armaments, but unless you can engage Al-Shabaab in sort of decisive battles, you're not going to be able to bring that military you know, equipment to bear in the most effective way. And so that, I think, is the challenge. And that's not really, you know, down to whether the arms embargo is lifted or, or not. OK, Paul, uh, last question. I'm going to try and um, bundle a couple of here. Um, 
You mentioned it earlier in your presentation that the uh, NSOM uh, four operating bases were highly dispersed. Why was that? Was it because of the limitations of the Somali forces uh, in and of themselves? Or was it some kind of strategic um, decision, error? Um, you mentioned the airport and the port, which makes sense. Um, and given you know, the weaknesses of that highly dispersed nature, will that inform other peacekeeping uh, lessons learned? And will this change or impact influence uh, the African Union uh, doctrine? Yeah, good question. I'll, I'll try my best. So the reason they had dispersed forces was, I would argue, flew, flowed from their doctrine, right? They were, they were trying to follow, actually sort of closely borrowed a sort of U.S., clear hold build strategy right it was this sort of classic counterinsurgency doctrine that put an emphasis on clearing al shabab forces from certain territory particularly urban settlements first of all and then sort of you know spreading out further and so at the foundation of their military doctrine that they were following put an emphasis on capturing territory so that is why I think fundamentally the AU used to spread its forces over such large areas because it thought that if you put a company of soldiers near these you know, settlements, as I, I showed you on the map, that that would somehow, you know, gain the territory. Al-Shabaab would be cleared from those areas and then we could build a sort of peace dividend and, you know, reconstruction through a set of stabilization um, mechanism. So it's I think, you know, it fundamentally privileged territorial expansion over the degradation or the defeat of Al-Shabaab's military capabilities. And an example here is that in, in 2012 and 2013, for example, the Ugandan forces went on offense against Al-Shabaab, but they did so without FOBs. They went mobile for weeks at a time, actually, in, in some campaigns. And so this was a choice that I think flowed from their military doctrine, right? Uh, now, I would argue, you know, what is the strategic utility of all these little forward operating bases with a company of soldiers on them, often who couldn't speak the local language of the local populations? My argument has been that I don't think that there's much strategic utility in adopting that force posture and that very sort of dispersed footprint. Instead, it left them very vulnerable to Al-Shabaab attacks, and it's cost an awful lot of money to logistically supply these huge, you know, supply lines that are, are required. Many of the times we have to fly logistical support rather than drive it because the, it's so dangerous in between the, the main supply routes between these bases. So my hope, and then the final part of your question, my hope would be that this is not replicated very often in the world of, of peace operations. I think this it's very dangerous to spread your forces out so thin when you're facing an enemy like Al-Shabaab. But if we look to the Sahel, uh, or the Lake Chad Basin, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see this posture adopted against Boko Haram or Janim or, you know, the Lord's Resistance Army as it was in Central Africa. I think if you if you are going to go on offense against these types of groups, you don't want these, you know, dispersed static forces of FOBs that are trying to well, I suppose be a bit like the American military. Um, you need to stick to the strengths of the the local African armies that we're using here, which are more, I would argue, more mobile and sort of um, you know, yeah, mobile types of offensive operations. Paul, that was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody listening in did. We're very grateful for you sharing your time on a Friday afternoon. Um Wish you a good weekend, and I would like to thank you from behalf of everybody at GTAC for your, your presentation, and thank everybody for listening in, and stay tuned. We hope to have another one earlier in, in the new year. So uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody, and we'll see you back um, in 2024. Thanks very much, Adam. Thank you, Paul.